All right, 112, folks. Um, I'm in uh, Unit 2 at this particular point. Uh, and actually, it's a mix between 1 and 2. I was talking uh, about uh, um, absolutism in class, and I figured I would touch on it again because it's worth discussing um, at length. Um, that's why I said it's between Unit 1 and Unit 2 because they introduce uh, Louis XIV. You know, who is the king? He is the sun king. He is the king uh, of France. And the thing is, is uh, he wants to be the absolute power. Most monarchs uh, rule uh, with the consent of, well, in, in Britain, the parliament. Uh, otherwise, in most cases, it is with the consent and assistance of the nobles who have agreed to cooperate with them. Uh, what Louis wants is he wants to be absolutely in charge. Well, he has... Um, some things on his side. The things that are on his side are, are going to be his father and his grandfather um, who have uh, set this in motion already about him being absolutely in charge. And so the policy we call it is absolutism because he wants to be the authority. Now there's some the basis for it that goes through. There's some philosophers that will pop up along the way that talk about divine right um, to rule and talk about the you know idea of investiture um, and this person of the divine right to rule by God, and so he's supported um, by the church in many cases. And, and the reason for that is simple, is if he supports the church, church supports him, they both uh, are going to be the authority and make quite a bit of money. The thing that's important about Louis, though, is um, how he takes power, how he maintains power, and the dynamic he sets up for the rest of Europe because he's highly successful, what will happen is his grandfather and father um, have already got this in the works. They've already been trying to combine power uh, under the throne by slowly bleeding the power away from um, the, the rest of the nobles at that particular point. And so when Louis is in his minority, when he's a kid, his father's still in charge, he's got some ministers working for him. Uh, one of those is going to be Cardinal Richelieu. Um, and, and so, yeah, Cardinal, you got to realize that he's involved with the church, and you have to realize that the Catholic Church is directly involved with the French government at this point. Where this fits in is that Richelieu is going to be working um, as a minister within the government to take and combine the different powers underneath the king himself. And so he's slowly going to be bleeding away the power from the nobles themselves, whether it's judiciaries or any number of things. Um, many of the positions within the government are hereditary. Um, that means that they've been given to a family. The family will always have that. They'll always be paid for it. They'll have the title and authority, um, regardless of how well they do the job. And so we know from governments, hereditary positions don't work well. And so what has happened is Richelieu has been trying to slowly bleed the power away from those positions, leaving them an intact <coughs> Uh, Louis is going to come along, and obviously, you know, he's going to be a kid, and Richelieu is going to pass, and in passing, as in dying, he's going to pass the baton on to his assistant, who is uh, Cardinal Mazarin, and Mazarin is going to take over as the minister um, for the king, and he will continue the process of stripping power from the nobles. The problem is he is not as adept um, at politics as what Richelieu is, and so what's going to happen is he's going to trigger an uprising among the nobles. And this uprising among the nobles becomes violent, uh, becomes riotous. This noble, uh, this uprising is called the Fronde, F-R-O-N-D-E, the Fronde. Um, it becomes violent in the fact that they're going to uh, storm the palace and it's going to put Louis at risk. And being that he's at risk, he, he knows this. It's going to make an imprint on him. And so when he comes to power, he knows that he definitely needs to restrict the power of the nobles. He doesn't want this happening again. And so what he will do is he will work to put the power underneath him. Um, this is significant. He's going to have some help. First it is going to be his first minister. His first minister is a gentleman named Jean-Baptiste Colbert, right? Um, Jean-Baptiste Colbert is going to be a finance minister. What he will do is he will revamp the finances of France in such a way that he's going to establish what we know of as mercantilism, um, also called bouillonism. The idea is the, the more silver and gold bouillon that you have in your treasury, the more powerful you are. Well, the idea of this is simple, is you're going to establish a far-reaching empire. You're going to establish a series of colonies that are far-reaching, 
and there's limitations. Uh, they're not allowed to manufacture certain things. They're not allowed to be in certain businesses, but what they will do is they will supply the mother or father country with raw materials and purchased finished goods. And so what you're doing is you're creating a supplier and you're creating a purchaser simultaneously. And since trade is restricted to strictly trade with the mother country, well, you know, you, you have a captive audience. The idea of limiting what they can manufacture is we're trying to create uh, state-sponsored industries and state-sponsored businesses and, and bring those along. One of those is going to be um, glass at one particular point, and there's a few other things along that line. It's significant, and so what will happen is uh, Colbert is going to uh, create this mercantile system, revamp the um, rest of the system, and put money in the bank for France. It'll put money, I mean, he'll fix the imbalance of the treasury in a positive way that they're going to build up a uh, um, supply of money, and Louis is going to have to find some way to put it to use. In addition to that, what will happen between Mazarin and between Louis is they're going to create a position called the Intendants. Intendants. And the Intendants are, are simple. Um, they're going to leave the hereditary positions, the, the judges and regional uh, advocates and things like that, um, in place. They're going to go ahead and pay them, but they're going to take the power from the positions and imbue it in the Intendants. And so the Intendants are going to be hired by Louis. They're going to be um, chosen by him. They're going to be paid by his new government that's set up. And so they're going to be loyal to him. And so basically what will happen is even though these other people have the titles, these other people have the money they're getting paid for it, they have no power. And so Louis is going to be able to consolidate power underneath him um, via the, the money from uh, Colbert, um, via the authority of the intendants, and you're going to look at the Marquis de Louvois. And the Marquis de Louvois is going to restructure the military. He's going to restructure the, the army for uh, France in such a way that what he does is he reorganizes the canteen um, to better equip, to better pay, to better supply the soldiers. So they're getting paid on a regular basis. They're better equipped. They're better trained. Um, and being as such, um, they're also going to be paid directly out of Louis' government, so the authority is going to rest on him, and they're going to be loyal to him. All this does is it restricts the authority of everyone else. On top of this, what Louis will do is uh, he will create the palace at Versailles, and he will hold court at Versailles, and the nobles will be required to attend court um, for, you know, so many months out of the year. Um, it, it's important because, listen, if he's bringing them in, they want to interact with him, they're going to have to come to court. They're going to have to Versailles, be at Versailles. They're going to have to stay at the palace, which means they're not outside. They're not back home. They're not out scheming and plotting and creating, you know, trouble for him behind the scenes that he has them under the thumb. And we're going to have this uh, this system of courtliness, this system of dances, this system um, where they are going to have to compete with one another in order to spend time with Louis the Fourteenth, in order to have the king's ear, so they can go ahead and promote their agendas. Um, what this does is allows his intendants to, to act. It allows his government to function, and he's going to eventually start to use his army to advance his policy of imperialism in such a way that they're going to start to conquer. Um, he wants to reach out and conquer a variety of places and expand the French Empire. Um, he, he's pretty reasonable. He's pretty successful about it. And what this does is this is going to inspire other monarchs. It's going to inspire uh, Peter the Great. You know, it's going to inspire uh, Charles, uh, Charles II. It's going to inspire uh, James. It's going to inspire um, quite a few other heads of state in the area to want to mimic what he does and, and take a page out of his book. So this is going to start an imperialistic, absolutist ideal throughout Europe and, and change the dynamic. This is also eventually going to trigger revolution. So I'm going to cut it off here.